It is an honor today to be talking to the fitness guru legend of all of dentistry. I mean, you are, buddy. You are a unbelievable role model. Um, so tell us, um, how did you? It's Uchi Odiatu. Yeah, that's perfect. And uh, thank you. And uh, and your father was from Nigeria, and my idol in dentistry, um, Dr. Bambi Dur Ogentebi, who taught endodontics at University of Missouri, Kansas City, was from Nigeria, and his wife was uh, Cami, and they had three kids, uh, Coco, Deji Boy, and Falaka, and he was just so amazingly genius, and I asked him one day, I'm, I was babysitting his three kids, uh, he, he needed a babysitter, so I was a student, I, I'll babysit, I can babysit, and I grew up with five sisters and a little brother. And uh, I asked him, I said, why are you, how are, why are you so smart? And he said, and you know what he said? He said something very profound. He said, you know, he said, when you grow up in Nigeria and you're studying root canals, um, there's basically three major camps. There's kind of the Germans who affect all of Europe. There's kind of the Japan that affects all of Asia. And there's kind of the United States, which affects all of North America. And if you grow up in America or Europe or Japan, you just drink the Kool-Aid. But when you're in Nigeria, when you're in Africa, you always are studying between these three opposing philosophies, and the truth is always somewhere in the middle. And he goes, he goes, I think, I think Nigerians were taught to think where people in America were just taught, this is, this is how you think and what you do. And in Europe, this is how you think and what you do. In Japan, here, you know. And he, he was the most intellectual son of a gun I ever met in my <laughs> life. And then you said your father moved to uh, London, um, where he met your mother. Uh, and uh, I'm a hundred percent Irish, and your mother's Irish Catholic, so I know. Oh, our- Brian. Oh, Brian, born in Dublin, and uh, met him on a blind date in the early '60s in London, England. So, so I'm, um, I'm wondering who was who was crazier, your Irish Catholic mother or my Irish Catholic mother? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in fact, what's funny is we're coming up on March 17th. Uh, of the Irish. <laughs> yeah, and that's the day Dentaltown was born in 1999. Oh, oh. So, wow, I love uh, Yeah, so uh, it's always a big day. It'll be 16 years for us. So, so now tell us, how did you get into fitness and dentistry? Tell, tell, tell us how that started. Because you, you are, I mean, when anybody in dentistry thinks of fitness guru in dentistry, it's you. So how, how did you get into this? Yeah, thanks, Howard. You know what? Um, I, I, I like Abraham Lincoln's quote. He said, all that I am and all that I hope to be is because of my mother. And uh, my mom <laughs> gave us fish oil, cod liver oil back in the early 60s. You know, each of the kids from tallest to shortest, you know, had a big, we had a big teaspoon of cod liver oil. And the um, funny thing is that silver spoon had a, a dent in it because it was the same silver spoon she used to beat us with, okay? So I had a mixed emotions when it came time to nutrition. But- uh, Oh, she was using it for punishment. Oh, punishment, food, you name it. We stirred the pot, you name it. She chased us around the house. But, um, but nutrition was number one. Uh, you know, wheat germ went on our cornflakes. Uh, my mom gave us cod of oil for our brain. And, uh, you know, I, I see now Harvard and Tufts and John Hopkins, you know, still doing studies 40 years later saying, is fish oil good for the brain? And I'm like, my mother and her mother and her mother have been given fish oil for hundreds of years. And we're still studying what I call the painstaking restatement of the obvious. You know, not, not everyone's out there in the skinny branches studying the fringe stuff. Most of us are doing the safe and tried and true. But I, so anyway, so I grew up with this fish oil. And um, to this day, I give it to my kids. You now we have a, a little girl, eight, six, another one, three. One on the way, Howard. So uh, in six weeks, Karen and I are expecting a, a little baby. What number is so, that for you? Number four. That's how number- many I have. So is, is, this, is this your caboose or are you going to go for five? Who knows? I think you can't get a, a show on television without at least having six. So I don't know. We'll see, you know. But um uh, but nutrition was number one. And uh, so my mom fed us well. My dad was a huge lover of books. We had books everywhere in our house. You know, I, I slid over Del Carnegie books. I slipped on, you know, uh, Napoleon Hill books. And to this day, our house is full of books. You know, I'm a voracious reader. And I think a big part of getting fit and healthy is looking at the common threads. You know, I, I see so many people actually getting stuck on P90X or Sean T or Richard Simmons or Paleo or... CrossFit and Locale, Attican and Pritkin. And what I've done is I look at the common threads because there's more similarities than dissimilar. So when you put it all together and you share it with passion, and I firmly believe, you know, enthusiasm is a sizzle that uh, sells the steak, um, just to get audiences and readers, 
you know, creating some leverage to get them to make changes, um, I, I can create changes. And I, I love some of the, the emails and stories I get back after about people losing 10 pounds and 20 pounds. And many of them haven't even bought our book for crying out loud. But all of it is, is something in something we've said or a story has resonated with one of their 100 trillion cells. And they say, I'm going to make it happen. You know, ooch, at 10 o'clock this morning, you, you, you shared something that turned my heart on heart on. <laughs> and, um, you know, 60 days, 90 days later, um, they're emailing me saying, ooch, I've lost 15 pounds. What's next? You know, what do I do next? So I love that, you know, and I, 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 I like to learn more so I can share more. And that's, that's my philosophy. Okay. So let, let's, let's start, I'm going to start pinning it down to the, uh, the, the, the oldest excuses. Um, we know some people are born with what did they call it? Ectomorphic body where they're just always sure. skinny and there's what a mesomorphic body, which right. I think I've been told by personal trainers I am. And then what's that? An endomorphic? Yes. And, yes. and what is it? What is the endomorph? Just a bigger body? Endo means you have, you have more rounded corners. You know, ectomorph is thin, naturally thin. Mesomorph, which is naturally muscular, which is almost like the rock, like the Dwayne Johnson. Endomorph is like Jim Belushi or John Candy, Elvis Presley, like rounded. So oh, skinny God. is like Hugh Grant. Mesomorph is like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. And endomorph is like John Candy. So mesomorph rocks. However, um, a skinny person who's out of balance will gain weight and look like John Candy if they're living a life out of balance. While uh, an endomorph, a John Candy, if they get out of balance and they have like body dysmorphia and they can have a thing like anorexia or orthorexia, which is obsession with correct eating, they can get too skinny. So the whole idea is to honor your, your, your type of body. So if you're a mesomorph, use your muscle and your transformational language and your metabolism the way it's supposed to. If you're naturally thin, don't try and put on 60 pounds and go in a bodybuilding contest. Just enjoy a thin, wiry, lean physique and be a runner. You know, you can do CrossFit, but you're never going to set any records. But so I say honor the, the type of you were born with and use it. If you're an endomorph, you're probably a really solid person. You know, you probably have a lot of hardiness to you, you know, but if you try and be whip thin, you're going to mess up with your mind. So I'd say discover where you are and then use that type to your advantage. And what are you? I'm more of a mesomorph. I'm, I'm like you. I'm, I'm, I'm lean. I'm, they say mesomorphs are often the articulate, fiery, uh, quick talkers. Uh, we have fast metabolisms. Uh, we sweat when we eat because it's, it's fire and water coming together. We're transformational. You know, we make things happen. We incite, we ignite. And that's part of the mesomorph. You know, you think, look at The Rock when he was on WWF. Yeah, you know, how he's able to transform a crowd of 15,000. Look at you at, at a townie meeting, you know, getting carried out of the room with on four bodyguards, you know. So, um, so I'm definitely a mesomorph. I'm hardy, you know. I lift weights. Um, but if I, if I tried to get really thin and tiny, I would, I'd have all kinds of problems. And if I try and run a lot, my flat feet like Freddie Flintstone give me all kinds of knee problems. So when I do my cardio with my flat feet, I know now elliptical. I know now cycling is better. I know now. And if I ever tried to be a runner, I'm my back and my hips and my knee are going to get out of whack. And I want to be an 80, 90, 100 year old man still going to the gym. I don't want to be showing pictures of my, me at, at age 20 in a marathon, you know? So I say honor your body type and use it um, and don't try and change your structure. It's impossible. Because a, a, a cheetah is 1% body fat and a lion is 38% body fat. And I don't think a lion can go on a diet and be a cheetah. And a cheetah probably can't start drinking protein shakes and be a lion. Is that kind of what you're saying in a way? Uh, correct. But, but you know, be, but any, every one of those three types can look good and be healthy. But I do find, though, if, if you think of 70% of the Americans now are overweight, 35% obese. That's crazy. You know, you think of 300 million Americans or 330 million North Americans, 70% or almost 220 million people in this continent of North America are overweight or obese. You know, diabetes is, um, is killing people. You know, what I've, I saw on stat the other day that 2,000 people a day die of heart attacks in America. 2,000. Um, 2,000 Americans die every day of cancer. You know, that's terrible. And, and, and that should be almost on the ticker tape on CNN and Fox News. Like, you know, it's now February 25th, um, live doing this. And I'd say if it's been 70 days, 140,000 Americans have died of, of heart attack. That's crazy. So I, I, I want to I ask you um, something about, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I think the, the smartest people are guys like uh, you and me who have had the opportunity to go around the world. I mean, you, 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 I mean, how many countries have you been to? 
Um, seven. I, I'm going to Denmark. I haven't, I haven't been to 50, but I'm going to Denmark in April, all over the U.S., Canada. Yeah, so, so, you know, like like in, in the United States, you know, they, they always want to, op- you know, I think it's natural heuristic to oversimplify everything. Um, and the, the, they'll sit there and say, well, the reason Americans are fat is because of McDonald's. And then yeah. I'm sitting there thinking like, well, I've been to 50 countries with a McDonald's on every corner and there's no fat people. Um, yeah. Just that they walk two miles from their house, go to McDonald's, eat the same thing you do, and then turn around and walk two miles back, whereas you get in your car and then go to the drive-thru and then drive back home and eat it in a chair. Um, so there's so many variations, but one thing that's all over Dentaltown and everybody's talking about, and I, it was going to be the first question I asked you, there's people saying that um, one, of the, one theory of why Americans are so fat is that Americans are 5% of the planet. They take half of the antibiotics. I grew up in Kansas, so I knew as a very little kid that probably 90% of all the antibiotics made in America goes into cattle feed and pig feed because those entrepreneur farmers figured out back in 1950 that when you feed cows and dairy cows and pigs uh, antibiotics in their feed, they, they just get fat. Do you think that one cause of the obesity is that we've messed up our microbiome, uh, our gut bacteria from our mouth to 30 feet to the back door with all kinds of Keflex and cephalosporins and all, all this stuff like that? Do you, do you think our gut microbiome is off? Well, for sure. And that's a, a finer point, but for sure. And I've, I've seen a USA Today, uh, you know, your national newspaper had an article where they said, since the 70s, medical doctors have said they've been trying to lobby Congress to say no more penicillin, te- penicillin and tetracycline are the most often used um, antibiotics given to cattle to make them big and fat. And, and it's, it's a business model. I can understand it. If I was a farmer, I would be probably wanting to give my, my, fat, my, my cattle penicillin and tetracycline also, but I'm, I'm not. But so since the 70s, doctors have said it's not the dentist giving antibiotics three times a year. It's not your ear infection where the mom brings their kid down because the ear is sore and the doctor gives them antibiotics. And we always think, oh, I don't want to make my, my child resistant because we know with anti- he's been on antibiotics three times this year. It's a fact that every, all the meat, and it's the average American eats for half a pound a day. If you eat conventionally raised meat, you know, and these cattle, I'd say 98% of them are fed corn and soy. Cattle are meant to ra- graze on, on grass and hay in the winter. But so if a cattle is fed corn and soy, they're big and fat, they're huge. You get a big juicy steak, big juicy hamburger. You give them therapeutic and growth producing, you know, penicillin and tetracycline, you will have a fat swollen cattle full of corn and soy, you know, cattle are meant to eat, not corn on the cob, they're meant to graze. So if we're eating half a pound of that every day and medical doctors, the AMA have for years have said, please stop Congress, please tell the cattle producers not to give you know, antibiotics to the animals only for therapeutic purposes, you know, for disease. And the lobby group of the cattle producers is so strong. They said, um, okay, how about we do it voluntarily? And Congress said, okay, doctors, what's that like? And the doctors went, that's not enough. And the cattle farmers said, this is what we're going to do. And Congress went, okay. <laughs> so, so that's where we're at it. So, so I'll say, and, and, and I want to, I always want to say one thing to international viewers because so many times, um, dentists around the world will tell me, "Well, I think this is a good idea because that's how your country does it." And I want to remind all of our international viewers because these podcasts are listening to in every country is that okay. um, the American government only has there's only one motto of the American government: money is the answer. What's the question? So just because America's doing it has no correlation to whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. It's just about big money. And I, I'm an American. I'm 52. I have the right to say that. I voted in every election. America has money's the answer. What's the question? So if we're doing it, it could be the best or the worst idea ever found. But but continue. So, so, the, so then the question is going to be, well, if that cow is eating penicillin and you said penicillin and tetracycline Pet, penicillin and tetracycline are the two biggest ones that are because this is when the fda but, said but is and there, you said they're eating a half pound of meat well there are you saying there's trace antibiotics of that in the meat or are you just saying sure. it's just changed the meat no it, it's it, the food chain condenses as you go up the food chain the polar bear is one of the most toxic animals in the arctic because it's eating all the seafood which is basically the ocean is the world's sewer so the the, the, the polar bears all they eat is you know, food out of the ocean sewer. So they're a pretty toxic group. Very few of them having problems procreating. You know, they can't even swim. They're, you know, they're they're having their own problems. Human beings are the next big 
end of the food chain. So nutrition and toxins condense as it goes up the food chain. So whatever the animal eats, we're eating it. And that's why the same, if I want to give you an analogy, when you eat garlic, the next day, what, what does your smet swell like? Garlic. Garlic. So everything you eat is in, is every one of your cells affects every one of your 100 trillion cells. So I don't want to get too far off the beaten path. It's, you know, it, it, there's so many ways people, people to get in shape. But um, if an animal is eating antibiotics, not just for a couple weeks a year because of infection, if they're eating it daily as part of their feed, um, trust me, it's in your hamburger, it's in your ribeye, it's in your T-bone, and you're eating it. If you're eating half a pound a day, you're eating bacon at breakfast, a Whopper at, at lunchtime, you're eating a half pound steak at nighttime from your favorite restaurant, you're getting antibiotics three meals a day. So, but you know what, that being said, you can still be healthy if you can choose free range. On the other hand, one of the best ways to detoxify what we're talking about is to fast. You know, a lot of the world religions talk about fasting. It's not just for spiritual practices. Fasting gives your body a break from digestion. Digestion is one of the biggest users of energy in the body. That's why after Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner, we are what, high energy or low energy? Low. Low energy. So if you fast, and there's news research now, it's called intermittent fasting. I'm not sure if you heard about it. Intermittent fasting, a lot of athletes are doing it now. And the research now in the last five to 10 years on intermittent fasting is it can increase sirtuin. Sirtuin is a neurotransmitter or growth hormone in your body, or sorry, a hormone in your body. What it does is it makes your cells replicate more accurately and it's life extending. So people who regularly fast have longer life expectancy than people who eat three meals a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So you can even eat, so they didn't even quantify eating bad or poor. All they're saying is give your body a break from digestion, a few meals a week or a, a day a month or a day a week if you're really into it, and you can increase the quantity of sirtuin, S-I-R-T-U-I-N in your body. And what it does is it makes the 70 DNA replications, which is how the body uh, makes new cells, more accurate in how they get made. And your body makes less mistakes with more sirtuin. And mice studies, this is what, it was all done with mice. The mice lives about an average of two years. They can increase the life expectancy of a mouse by 30% by decreasing the caloric intake by 30%. So these studies now have been extrapolated to humans and there's now caloric restriction societies in America, which are saying no matter what you're eating, if you lower your caloric intake, you can live longer. So th that's not even talking about antibiotics. So, so antibiotics, I think, and gut flora are maybe one of the hundred things we can be concerned about. But ideally, I look at the six pillars of health, Howard. I look at sleep. I look at, I look at food. I look at exercise. I look at your thoughts. I look at how you breathe. And I look at how much water you're drinking. And the seventh pillar I always like to add in my mouth-body connection seminars is oral, oral hygiene because inflammation in the mouth um, seeds inflammation everywhere. So um, those are my seven pillars, basically. And, it, yeah, I and if I sleep, I got sleep, food, exercise, thoughts, water, uh, oral hygiene. That's six. You said and how you breathe. breathe. You got how, how you breathe. breathe. And breathing's huge. Like my, my daughter, my eight-year-old daughter, one time came up to me. We're, we're talking, and she said, um, "Dad, what's the most valuable thing on the planet? Is it gold?" I said, "No." She goes, "Is it diamonds?" No. And I said, "Is it? Is it mum?" And I said, I love mom. I said, but I've been without mom for four days when I was speaking. I said, I can't go more than two minutes without oxygen. And she goes, you mean oxygen is more important than mom? I said, you know what? I can't live more than two minutes without oxygen. So she goes, okay, oxygen first, then mom. And I said, no, I said, sleep. I've, got, I've never gone more than two days without sleep. And she goes, okay, air, sleep, then mom. I said, no water. I can't go more than four days without water. And she goes, where do I fit in? And the joke was, and now whenever she's with a group of adults, she always says, I know what the most valuable thing on the, on the planet is. And every adult always says what? Oh, palladium, platinum, titanium, diamonds, fuel. Every adult gets it wrong. Like at the next party, Howard, say what's the most valuable thing on the planet? And people kind of know it's a trick question, but they'll say gold or fuel. And you tell them to hold their breath for 30 seconds and they'll soon realize oxygen. So how we breathe literally changes the physiology of our cells. And in the middle of a seminar, I'll have people who hold their breath and breathe differently. And I can share with them how they can actually experience euphoric thoughts or depressed thoughts simply by changing how they breathe. So I think breath is one of the top three now ways you can change your health and vitality. And, uh, and how old are you, by the way? I'm 51. I was born in 1963. So. Oh, my God. I'm 52. I was born in 62. You look, you look like you're my uh, younger brother. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's true because when we were um, – Look, look how the fighting sport has changed uh, from uh, boxing was the big thing when I was a kid, Muhammad Ali and Frazier and Foreman, and now it's UFC. And, and you look at those UFC, the Brazilians came in there 
And, you know, these Americans wanted to slug it out and box and whatever. And horse gracing, those guys said, what, what does a cheetah and a lion and a tiger do? They, they don't go box you. They don't go kick you. They go right for your throat. Yeah. And, they, and, and horse gracie, I mean, he'd walk out of the mountain. You think this guy is going to get his butt kicked. Yeah. Yeah. And he'd just slip a chokehold on him. And the biggest guy in the world would tap out. I've seen I've seen a big guy and a small guy fight. Gracie trained. And the big guy would pound the small guy, pound the small guy. And all the little guy was looking for is a way to get a hold on you. And all of a sudden, I thought, this little guy, he's been banged on the head, he's banged on the back. The next minute, I saw this guy hold his arm, and the big guy didn't give up. And, it, and all of a sudden, the guy's arm was broken. Like his forearm broke and match over. So it's definitely, I think, thinking smarter, training smarter, doing dentistry smarter definitely has its advantage in 2015. Okay, I want to I stop you right here because you're a dentist. I mean, everybody, you always talk about fitness, but you are a dentist. There's... When you, um, I've been in dentistry 25 years, do dentists and hygienists and receptionists and assistants, do we have different health issues because we work in a dental office? Do you, do you think there's anything unique to dentists versus, uh, and hygienists, you know, working as opposed to uh, doing working construction or working physical? I, I remember when I was little, sometimes we would, uh, we would bale hay. And I mean, spending a day throwing 90 pound bales of hay in the back of the truck it's very wow. different than doing a DO composite um, every hour. Um, what's unique to dentistry and what, what, is, what advice would you give to people who work in the dental industry and our type of job? Because, I mean, granted, we don't get any exercise in dentistry. Would you agree? You know, great question. You know what? What's the funny thing is I lecture to dental audiences mainly, but about 20% of the time now I do lecture to general population. And believe it or not, when I look out in a general population audience as compared to a hygienist and dentist, guess what? We're healthier. I see brighter smiles. I see sharper eyes. I see better posture. I see less wrinkles. I see more health and vitality. When I look out at the general population, I see a lot of slouching and people sucking back coffee. And that. so I think overall, just my own ad hoc observational study, general de dentist audiences are healthier than the general population. So we are doing something right for sure. And I think part of it is I just saw a report where it said out of the top seven jobs, careers now, in North America, dentistry was number one. Did you see that? Yes. And, and hygiene was five. Is, is that crazy? Yeah. So I, I think just having good financial solidity makes takes a lot of times dollars off your worry list. Even though dentists worry about getting wealthier and hygienists want more money, I think the minute you don't have finances off your worry list, you can then start thinking of, am I really happy? Um, am I walking enough? You know, am I spending enough time with my wife or my children or my husband? So. I definitely think dentistry and hygienists and assistants will have it where it's going on. But I also find, um, I think because we spend an hour with patients, patients look up to us. I think patients right now are starving for attention. They're starving for wellness advice. Anytime I share with patients about that vitamin D is good for their brain, but vitamin D not only helps you absorb calcium better, vitamin D acts like a hormone in the body. It has 2,000 roles in the body. I tell them about omega-3s being an anti-inflammatory. And there was one study in Harvard that they, they looked at 9,000 studies, but 9,000 people. And what they found out was people who have regularly have 1,000 milligrams of fish oil in their diet every day are 20% less likely to have periodontitis. And I, that, that's all said in a minute after I put my topical on. And patients look up at me and go, Doc, I learn something new every time I come here. And they haven't seen my cone beam. They haven't seen my Cirac. All they know is that I care, that I'm telling them the latest information, and they can't wait to come back. And I, and I haven't even done my, my office tour. I, so I think dentistry, because of our long contact time, and hygienists out there, because of our long contact time, and assistants, when we go away to do a, a hygiene check, assistants, you, you can talk about your, your marriage coming up or your, your whatever, but if you start sharing about your own experience with being healthy or that I slept well last night, so I feel better today, patients look to the assistant for that information. I come back in, we're all talking the same language, and then I'll tell them, well, you know what? You're going to need a crown on that tooth. They already think, wow, doc, you care about all of me. I'll say yes to the crown. You know, so the, the metaphors for health and patients that feel that you're taking care of all of them, and they, they never get that anywhere else. I know there's med very good medical doctors out there and very good nurse practitioners, but overall, dentists and hygienists and assistants, we have 60 minutes usually of their undivided attention. And if you can share with them little snippets of health information that's pertinent to their health and their overall body, they say yes to your caring, they say yes to your case presentations, and they'll say yes to coming in more frequently because you know, they've shown that when you take care of inflammation in the mouth, it takes care of inflammation in the rest of the body. 
And people are suffering from arthritis, cardiovascular disease. They've shown that cancer has inflammatory origins. And when this rolls off people's tongues easily, they're saying yes to your office. They're bringing in their husband as a patient. They're bringing in their kids. And it's, it's, a, it's a crazy avalanche of energy. You know, it's funny because you, you said your pillars were, were six. You, know, seven. you said sleep, food, exercise, thoughts, water, breathe, uh, oral hygiene. And the thoughts thing is what I'm keen in on what you're saying because I, I, I've, I've been in the offices of all the legends and I've been in a gazillion offices that needed a consultant. And it's so tough when you're uh, consulting with Dennis because the one thing that's most important isn't the CIRAC and the CBT and whatever. It's all the guys who are crushing it. They walk in with the thoughts, the energy, the karma, like how you doing and what's going on. And they talk about the person. So it's all about the person. And then the person who just can't get it going, they just walk in and they're just low energy. And they're like, how are you doing? Uchi? Uh, you have uh a toothache I hear and you have interproximal decay and you're going to need a root canal. And, and that, that's the hardest thing to teach. It's like the most important thing you have to teach a business owner is that positive thoughts and karma and energy and metabolism surround yourself with people who just love what they're doing, but they want to focus all that. The secret of success is going to the Panky Institute for six weeks and learning occlusion and then going to spear and coice and learning, you know, full mouth restoration. And they missed the whole thing that, yeah, I, that, that, that all those things aren't going to apply until you walk in there and own the room with energy and karma. And like Del Carnegie said, you know, everybody wants to hear their own name. And, and when you're talking about health, that, that's about that person. They, they want to hear yeah. about them living 30% long. They don't want to hear about your grandkid and your marriage and negativity. Yeah. And you go into offices and the, you know, the patient's like, well, how are you doing? Well, my husband, you know, we haven't been getting along very good. And, <laughs> you know, he doesn't do the dishes or never helps me. And it's like, God. And, and, yeah. and then their question is, should we get a CIRAC machine? <laughs> you know? well, there's no doubt that, that, that technical skills are important. You know, I, I've been to Panky. I've, I've only been to so C1. Have I, I've been, so have I. It's I, awesome. I, I've been to Panky, MAGD, Diplomat, the National Congress. I'm not, I'm not throwing those guys under a bus. I'm just saying you've sure. got to have the right thoughts and energy and karma first. But I think dentists, because of our personalities, we're so OCD. We're so structured to look for evidence. We're so structured to find out, could you show me the 30 studies that show that? Could you show me the 52 studies? And what's the Cochrane analysis? And I'm like, if you need a Cochrane analysis before you do something, if you want 50,000 papers to be, to be shown to you before you do something, um, there's research to show that exercise is going to increase your quantity and quality of life. There's research to show there's thousands of papers showing that omega-3s help you. There's hundreds of papers showing that sitting all day is bad for you. There's hundreds of papers that show that if you sleep six hours or less a night, you have more inflammation. Are you doing any of those? And the dentist goes, I guess it's not evidence that I need more of. I just need some motivation. So they realize now that there's, there's, there's studies and books and papers to show that positive thinking. And I think I saw it was the WHI, um, World Health Initiative. Uh, since 1994, they did a 20-year study on 100,000 women. What they found out was um, if you're an optimist, you, you, increase, you decrease your chance of cardiovascular disease by 30% compared to pessimists, and you have 14% less likely chance of dying from, from all diseases than pessimists. So if a dentist wants proof that being an optimist helps you, if I can increase my chance of living longer by 14%, and if I'm earning, the average dentist makes 140 grand a year, you know, if I had another 10 years on, it's going to give you $1.4 million if you're an average dentist by practicing 10 more years. Put a smile on your face put it with scotch tape on until you can really do it and, and start being an optimist. So um, I don't think dentists need more evidence. They need people like you. They need people like me giving them proof, but also letting them feel it, sharing the evidence. But at the same time, though, in audiences with participation exercises, show them how quick they can go from feeling in the dumps by breathing with their head leaning over to putting their head back, looking up at the sky and saying, OK, when I think about my overhead now with my head up breathing deep, it doesn't look so bad. When I look now, thinking about my overhead, it looks like overwhelming. So even changing your posture can change how you think. So I think dentists love information, that they're, they're information junkies like yourself. But at the same time, though, I'm, I'm going around the world just sharing my evidence, but at the same time, engaging people with audience participation exercises. They can feel what I'm feeling to leave them with the sense, okay, he gave me hope. I think it's possible. I'm going to get started today. And that's my mandate. Get started today. You know, you know, you know um, 
San, Sandy Pardue once told me, this is probably confidential and I shouldn't say it, but you know, it never stopped me before. <laughs> she, she always told me that the, uh, the most uh, successful office she's ever seen in her entire life, and she's seen thousands of offices, was a guy in Louisiana named Jerome Smith. And Jerome told me one time that, um, you know, his doctor told him that uh, he shouldn't be jogging anymore. You know, he's getting too old and it's hurting his bones and back and everything. So Jerome quit jogging, you know, taking his doctor's advice. But he said after six months, he, he didn't care about whether it was good or bad for his body. He, he said he, he didn't like where it was taking his mind. And then he realized that, you know, he, he runs when he wakes up, you know, a five mile run for him just gets him in the zone mentally. And he didn't, he didn't care if that was good or bad for arthritis or knees or anything like that. And, and I, I just think that, um, that, 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 that people think that they should eat right and diet and all that stuff. So they'll look good in a bikini, uh, at the <laughs> next pool party. And, and that's all true and everything, but it's what it does for your three and a half pound brain, uh, yeah. is what you, is why you need to exercise. I mean, you, you want to exercise because everything you think and know is inside your little noodle here. And when you exercise, that noodle is just so much better. Well, I just say, I think most of us, and almost everyone starts dieting or eating healthy to look better. They want to look hot. They got a high school reunion. They got an anniversary coming up. But when I think of the most powerful reasons to get healthy, forget the shallow cosmetic part. That's, that'll come in time. That comes no matter what. But focus on being a better communicator because 90% of communication is body language. And if you're pain-free, if you got a good back, if you got good gut flora, if your neck doesn't hurt, if you're breathing deep, your body language is gonna be committed so much more accurately. Um, they've shown that there's a neurotransmitter called BDNF. It's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. People who exercise have more of it in their body. So that's why you know 85% of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies exercise. And 85% of the general population doesn't exercise. Because they want a person who is in charge of 10, 40, 50,000 people to be thinking powerful, big vision thinking thoughts. If you're a sedentary CEO, you're probably not in charge of 50,000 people. And look at the, all the US presidents, all of them lift weights, stretch, move, lift, exercise. You know, from Barack Obama down to um, a Gerald Ford. You know, Gerald Ford, he, he took his shirt off in the 70s. The guy was, looked like a, a linebacker. And I think he was a college football player. So I thinking if dentists are looking for reasons to look great, forget, you know, a lot of times the dentist sends the hygienist to see my courses. I look out on 800 people, I see 700 hygienists. Um, I asked how many dentists here? Eight. And the funny thing, the dentists are all next door looking at the crown prepping course. And I'm thinking, you're going to prep a lot more crowns with a better back, better eyes, and better decision making if you come to my course. And I think over time now, I'm seeing more dentists show up. But what they've shown is if someone goes from being out of shape to in shape, they can increase their personal productivity by 25%. So if someone's billing a million dollars a year and they're out of shape and they get a flat stomach, they're going to bill 1.25 million the next year. Cone beam, Syrac, Panky, that's all aside, simply getting in shape. So I'm telling the male dentist, and I'm probably speaking to the male dentist more than the female because we're the ones most guilty of just going to the crown prepping courses. Get in shape, earn more, think better, be happier, be a better leader. And it all, like, I, like, I love that JFK quote, you know, when the tide comes in, all ships rise together. And it's beautiful to see. Yeah, and I'll just review every crown and bridge course I've ever taken. Uh, you take two millimeters off the top, and then you go round, round, round. That's that's pretty much it. Um, I, I, I want to say one thing that I, um, how long is your course when you lecture at meetings? It uh, depends. I've I've flown down to Arizona. I did a talk for the Department of Housing. This wasn't even dentists. I talked to three hundred bankers and land developers and uh, brokers, and I gave a forty-five minute course called "Maximize Your Energy." It was, it was a keynote. And I've done, I did five three-hour sessions at Yankee two weeks ago. So, well, But what is, your, what is your preferred length of time? Um, I love a day. I love immersion. If you I get... Love a day? Because, because my, what I wish you would do is um, we, have, um, we have 310 one-hour-long um, courses on Dentaltown. And um, a lot of those people will put up a course and tell me that they'll book 60 to 70 speaking engagements because what they don't realize is the mechanics of finding a speaker. And I want you to be a more popular speaker because everyone needs to hear your message. That's why I'm interviewing you today is, yeah, thank you. you know, it, it'll be, you know, there's 250 component societies. They get three volunteer dentists. And they say, okay, we need a course on root canals and one on gum disease and then find something for the staff. That's why practice manage is big because they need something for the staff because they're every dentist. There's a hygienist, two assistants, two receptionists. 
and these guys, and they say, and don't get the ones we had last year. Try to find some new speakers. So they go to Dunnelltown, and it's like everybody's one hour little um, debut. And they'll say, well, I'm in charge of an endo speaker. And the, so they'll listen to like six one hour lectures in endo and say, well, I really like that guy. And, and the hardest um, area to fill is the one for the staff. And uh, my God, if you had an hour course up on Dentaltown, I guarantee you, you'd get 50 invitationals uh, from your time there because people see it and say, oh, well, that'd be great for the staff. And anybody who hears you for an hour is going to love you and like you and all that. And uh, so that's the mechanics. Like, like, so when people say, well, why do you get, uh, um, why do you get, um, why do you speak so much? It's because they, they heard a demo somewhere on a tape or a cassette okay. or, or on dental town or whatever. So, so do that for uh, the dental profession. Thank you. I will. I, yeah, I want to get out there. I'm so, so it, I want to, I want to, I want to pin you down to more specifics because I, I, I try to ask questions on uh, these that aren't for me, but how I think what everyone's going to be asking. So what everybody's sitting there thinking right now is uh, they're either negative thoughts and saying, Oh, Ochi, you were born hot and thin and muscular. And th this, this, I mean, I think it's one of the reasons a lot of people like myself don't really care for basketball because I was a wrestler. I, I, I wrestle people that always weighed within five pounds of me. But if I try to join basketball, well, if you're born seven foot four and I'm five foot seven, do we really have a game here? So a lot of people are thinking, Ochi, you were born that way. Uh, but I know that the, the question a lot of people are thinking is they're so confused on the diets. They've heard of South Beach and they've heard of paleo and they've heard of, you know, all these diets. So what diet would you tell these uh, room full of hygienists? What, 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 how, how would they, how are they supposed to eat? Are you, are you pro vegan? Uh, okay. Do you eat meat? Uh, you know, what, what's the, what's the diet they should uh, follow? Okay. Okay. I love those questions. One thing I, I walk my talk, you know, I'm 51. Uh, in high in grade 12, I weighed 212 pounds. Um, and not, five years after graduating from dental school, I was 230 pounds, five foot eight. I would say if, I, if you put a pair of red cords and a red shirt on me, I look like a little fat fire hydrant back in 1994. So 20 years later now, age 51, I'm 179. I'm about 8% body fat, right? I can do 23 chin-ups on a bar. To get into the Marines, you have to do a minimum of three. And, and most people who apply for the Marines can't do three. They, they get 90% of people who are, try and apply, get kicked out. A lot of 18 year olds can't do three chin-ups. So 51 doing 23 chin-ups. I'll tell people how they can do that shortly. That's an easy way to learn how to do that. But so I'm also certified as a trainer in three different certification bodies, which is tough. Most trainers have one certification. I have NSCA, I have CanFit Pro and I have IFL, okay? So I, I read about eight journals a month, plus my dental, plus my CE for my courses and my crown prepping courses. So um. With three kids, one on the way, time is, I'm time crunched. So I, I do HIT training, which is interval training. I'll share how to do that right away. It's seven minutes of cardio of interval training is equal to an hour of steady state cardio. We'll, we'll talk about that right after. But the diet I follow mostly, I love the Mediterranean diet. Out of, uh, there was a huge seven year study in Spain uh, in 2013. And it, it put 5,000 people on this Mediterranean diet. Had them eat, eat more nuts, eat more olive oil, more grains, more vegetables less meat, a little bit of wine, dark chocolate. Um, it, they, de they decreased their stroke exposure by 30%. In five years, they had to stop the study because the people in the control group who weren't eating Mediterranean diet were dying of stroke. So, um, so the Mediterranean diet is perfect. And it's, very, it's, it's the most often, it's the easiest one to, it has the least dropout f factor because you don't count calories. All you do is you eat more vegetables, you eat more fruit, you eat yogurt every day, you have a glass of wine. If you're going to have alcohol, you have to have it with a meal because alcohol on its own spikes your blood sugar, which is not good for your brain. It's not good for your pancreas. It's not good for type 2 diabetes. So if you're going to have a glass of wine or a scotch or, or, a scotch or a vodka, have it with your meal and the body can absorb it better. And there's less of what's called postprandial dysmetabolism, which is a scientific word of saying messing with your metabolism. And um, nuts, grains like quinoa, no white bread. Limit your red meat, but if you're going to eat red meat, make sure it's free range, grass fed, which is key. And then the meat acts like medicine because when you have grass fed cows and grass fed chickens and free range chickens, um, and you can find a farm in any state, in any province in Canada, I'm sure any country around the world, where you can order special meat delivered to your house. In Canada, it's about $200 a month. They deliver awesome cuts of grass fed meat to your house. So I still eat red meat, we still eat wild fish. We still eat chicken, free-range chicken, free-range eggs. 
So I'm eating nature's medicine, unpure and sanctified, you know. So the Mediterranean diet kicks ass. Sorry, it kicks butt, okay? But at the same time, though, I add intermittent fasting. So about a year ago, I started fasting one day a week. I did that for a cleansing. Now, on a regular basis, I'll fast one day a month. And what it does is it gives my body a break from digestion. It makes my skin look like this, okay? It, gives my, it makes my eyes bright. You know, you, know you, don't, you can't see, there's no restal in here. All it does is, with omega-3s, staying hydrated, eating olive oil, drinking olive oil, a tablespoon of first press, cold press olive oil every morning, a tablespoon of fish oil every morning, Norwegian fish oil, okay? Um, 3,000 international units of vitamin D in a dropper form down the hatch twice a day. Um, I'll talk about vitamin D later. Um, that is my recipe for looking a certain way. And I just say, if you have ingredients and a recipe to make apple pie, you will get that same apple pie every time. You can't put the ingredients and a recipe for an apple pie together and get a lemon meringue pie. So as long as people are following the science, and it, it's not really my science. I basically studied thousands of people and I put it together and I've read the books, got the certifications. My wife and I live it, you know. Our kids, our little two-year-old jumped up on the chin-up bar at home and she goes, Daddy, I want to do chin-ups. I held her ankles. And this two-year-old pulled herself up seven times, you know. So um, my family lives it. We are, we're time crunched, but we make time for fitness. I do seven minutes of cardio a day, not an hour anymore. And I meant 180, 180 pounds is my line in the sand. I will, I'm like General Schwarzkopf in Desert Storm. I will not go over 180 ever again. Uh, many people have a gray area in the sand, you know. They lose weight, they get down to 170, and their gray area is 200. And then two years later, they creep back up again. So I think anytime someone loses weight, get a line in the sand and do not cross it. Like, you know, General Schwarzkopf said, you know, Saddam Hussein, do not cross my line in the sand. Dr. Ucho Diatu, do not cross this line in the sand. Mine is 180. And you can maintain a weight loss forever. Sorry, I, I went on there. And you're 5'7"? 5'8". 5'8". So 1A. Okay. So, so, but, so, so my, BMI, my BMI, actually, if you look at my BMI, body mass index, it no longer works for muscular people. My BMI is 26. If, if you're a doctor and look at me, they'll say you're overweight because my BMI is, but they've actually shown now, the Mayo Clinic showed la last year in March that waste is the more important. So if you're a man in North America, your waist has to be under 35 inches if you want to be healthy. And um, is, that the you, is that at the navel or the, the hip bones? Yeah. Um, the, the narrowest place. So at your navel about, at your navel. Navel. Okay, so, so I want to pin you down on specifics. So okay. you're talking about the Mediterranean diet, but walk us through what you eat in a day. Tell okay. me, you, you just woke up. Tell okay. you go to bed. Okay, I'm glad you asked. Immediately, I want water in my body. And it doesn't have to be reverse osmosis. It could be tap even, but I'd rather have filtered water. I, I squeeze a little bit of lemon in because what it does, it awakens your digestion. So I'll drink about a full glass of water. That's the first thing that goes down the hatch, right? So I, my body gets set. My body hasn't, hasn't had water for any hours. And as you know, water is one of the top seven pillars of health, right? So my body is starving for not food first, water first. Um, then I, most often because I'm time starved being a dentist, I'll have a shake. Um, I have a great whey protein powder. I put a, a, a teaspoon or a tablespoon of almond butter, almond butter in, which is a great saturated fat. It's also organic. So there's no pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Don't worry about that yet. You don't have to worry about organic food at this point. So I get almond butter in my olive, my olive oil. I put a teaspoon of olive oil in. Again, when you give the body fat, it slows down digestion. It also makes you feel fuller longer. And that's why a lot of diets don't work. People fill up on veggies and their body's starving for fat. The brain is two thirds fat. You know, DHA, which is an omega-3 fat, is, has 500 functions in the brain. And one in seven Americans have the right amount of omega-3s in their body, which is so six sevenths are starving for omega-3s. And if the brain has, has 500 functions for DHA, which is one of the omega-3s, you're not going to function. I don't care if you have a Cirac. I don't care if you have a cone beam. I don't care if you have, you know, panky trained hygienists. If you're not having omega-3s, you're going to make poor decisions. You're going to get tired. You're going to have inflammation. You're going to have sinusitis. You're going to have a runny nose, aches and pains. Anyways, I'll leave that aside. Sorry. So anyway, so I have my whey protein powder. I have my almond butter, a teaspoon of olive oil. I'll often put a teaspoon of fish oil in, scented so I don't taste the fish. I'll put a scoop of frozen blueberries in. I'll put some Greek yogurt in. I put it in a magic bullet or an isogenics blender. I blend it up. It gives me a cup of, of about 500 calories of the most dense form of nutrition I can have. 
And then when I leave the office, or I leave for the office two hours later, I'll have some green tea. Green tea is full of antioxidants. The, the most perfect one is called EGCG, epigallocatechin gallate. What it does is the book called Anti-Cancer, New Way of Life. And EGCG tells cancer cells to die off because cancer cells are cells that are like the video, Girls Gone Wild. Cancer cells don't know when to go home after a party. So our normal cells have what's normally called apoptosis. Normal cells are born, do their thing and die. Cancer cells don't die. So EGCG and green tea, you need two cups a day, steeped for five minutes. I have my first cup mid-morning. That gives me my EGCG, okay? It's full of um, flavonoids. It's full of, it's full of a little bit of caffeine to give me a little bit of a buzz, but not the spike of coffee. Like, you know, you and I are mesomorphs. We have enough fuel in our body, fire and fuel and gasoline and vinegar to keep us going. So you and I don't need a lot of coffee. It's like pouring gasoline on a fire. But a little bit of green tea for you and I, the mesomorphs, Howard, um, keep me going to lunchtime. Lunchtime, I'll bring a bag, um, a Ziploc bag now. I've refined my habits. I listened to one of my wife's friends who's also a trainer. I put a cup of um, instant organic oatmeal in a bag. I'll put, I put a, a handful of mixed non-salted nuts. I put another scoop of chocolate protein powder in this bag. So at lunchtime, I open up this bag. I, I put it in a cup of steaming hot water. This gives me fiber, carbs, protein, and fat. And now I'm good for another three hours. And then in that three hours now, I'll have half a can of salmon. All canned salmon is wild. You don't have to worry about mercury and toxins because wild salmon can tolerate a little bit of toxins because wild salmon and wild fish move around and they process the crap that's in the ocean. It's the farm salmon you got to wash out for. All canned salmon is wild. So I'll have a can of salmon, which is perfect for my omega threes. Um, I have a bunch of spinach, kale, miniature tomatoes, blueberries, nuts. Put a little bit of olive oil on. That's my three o'clock meal. So think of it now, Howard. I've given my premium, high performance race car body the best food of the day. I'm work Tuesday. I still work seven a.m. to seven p.m. And my patients come in and go, Doc. It's six o'clock. How are you feeling? I said, I'm feeling pretty good. They go, When did you get here? I said, Seven this morning. They said, Doc, you look like you just woke up because I'm giving my body the perfect food. And some people. The reason why they're tired is because they're eating frosted flakes and they're eating, you know, scotch and water at lunchtime. They're having pop tarts. They're having chicken, you know, not chicken, mega, they're eating chicken fingers and fries. And then they wonder why they have chicken and finger thoughts and pop tart feelings, you know. So I think if you're putting premium food in your body. So when I get home now at dinner time, Carrie will have ready for us steamed vegetables. And we don't make one vegetable. You know, there's thousand kinds of potatoes. So we have, you know, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, you know, cauliflower. She mixes it up in a very steamed medley. We have some quinoa. We have maybe some grass-fed beef, or we have some chicken, free-range chicken, or we have some steamed salmon. And this is my life. Like, you know, it, it, it's, I almost can't help but have a flat stomach because I'm only putting the good food in, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And it's become a no-brainer. Plus, we don't buy junk food for our house. The only time Carrie and I will eat junk food, and we call it OPH, other people's houses, okay? Because at 10 o'clock at night, when I'm starving for some junk food, or I'm going, to, you know, Carrie, where is your stash? She goes, we don't buy it. So unless I want to start the car in a house coat wearing, you know, an OJ mask, go down to the grocery store to buy some junk food, I'm not leaving the house at minus 10. I'm going to have some, oh, I'm going to have some snack of nuts. I'm going to have some sliced cucumber. And I'm writing my articles, giving myself the, the perfect fuel. So you, you, there you there you go. You have my, my perfect day. It's very simple. It's, 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 very not, it's not complicated. And I make it easy for myself to succeed. Why is all canned salmon free, right? uh, free ocean, not uh, farm salmon? How, how does uh, that... good question. Yeah, good question. Because restaurant salmon has to be big, right? They want the big Chinook salmon. So it's hard to find a big salmon wild in the ocean. So farm salmon is a lot more predictable. They put the fences in the ocean. They feed them all kinds of things to make them pink, big, and plump. And they come out nice and firm perfect for the restaurant plate. So, so most of restaurant salmon is going to be farmed. And, you know, is there anything wrong with salmon? It's better than, than chicken fingers and fries and potato wedges. I'd still rather eat a farm salmon than, you know, um, you know chicken fingers and, and fries. But at the same time, though, I want a salmon that's free. I want a salmon that has, has muscle and swam around the ocean that's mated properly with different other salmon, not all with their brothers and sisters in the same, in the same fence. Um, but all farm salmon is, is, is mostly restaurant salmon. And wild salmon is farmed because wild salmon is small and tiny and lean and muscular, you know, like, um, like uh, Bill Dorfman, <laughs> myself, okay? So we're wild and lean, but we're small. 
So when you they don't they don't mind when you cut up wild salmon and put it in the can, they don't care the size of it. That's why canned salmon is usually small salmon, but it's wild. So and wild salmon is better. You look at all the research. Wild salmon kicks the butt of farm salmon. Okay, I'm, I'm going to pin you down on more details. On, on this day, you work seven to seven. Did you get any exercise in, or is that your recovery day or off day or? Good question. Um, because I do only seven minutes of cardio, um, I, I won't exercise many times on my seven to seven day. But sometimes though, if I get home by eight o'clock, you know, have dinner, um, say goodnight to the kids. Carrie's on her coaching calls. Carrie does some life coaching and coaching calls. And so on 1030, guess what this crazy guy's doing? Because Wednesday, I don't start till two o'clock. I don't start till 2 p.m. I go down to my 24 hour gym, five minutes away, and I'll do a 45 minute combined compound set weight training and cardio workout. And I'm back home in an hour. And when you work out that late at night, guess who I work out with? Do you think I work out with 50 year olds plus? Nope. These people are 20 to 30 year old guys and girls. They're wired, hyper, happy, not complaining about their love handles, not complaining about their spouse or their job. They're just working out, listening to Pitbull. And I get pulled along in that frenzy. I come home at 11, a little bit wired. I read a bit. I sip some chamomile tea to quieten down my metabolic fire. I watch a little bit of E! Hollywood, a little Ryan Seacrest, a little bit of Kardashians, you know, chat with Carrie, off to bed by midnight. So, um, but many times though, on that seven to seven day, intuitively, if I don't feel like working out, I don't, but I will go downstairs and do seven minutes of interval training on our, on our stationary bike in my own home gym. And seven minutes of cardio interval training is equal to an hour of steady state cardio. So, so, what, so what does that mean? Seven minutes of, um, of, of interval training cardio. Does that mean you get on your bicycle and go like uh, a minute as fast as you can, then a minute, cool down, then a minute as fast as you can, then cool down. I mean, walk us through that. Yeah, yeah cool. You know, this is a show in itself, you know, because I think most dentists are, we're so time, time starved. If we did a talk on 60 minutes, how do you make exercise work for the dentist? I'm sure it'd be popular, but interval training in a nutshell is, the research now since the 70s, and a guy named Tabata, Professor Tabata, um, looked at five minutes of cardio. It was a Japanese study. And over four months, they took these Japanese athletes and they did five minutes of cardio three times a week. And after four months, they had the same level of aerobic conditioning as someone who did an hour four times a week. So it was literally one tenth the time. But in that five minutes, they did one minute of warm up. So if you get on a stationary bike, you do 60 seconds on a low tension right? You're just warming up your knees, warming up your lungs, getting your oxygen into your brain and your heart. And then 30 seconds, you put it on maximum intensity. You, I wouldn't do this if I was a deconditioned couch potato. So it's not healthy for someone who's not a, an, an athlete or a conditioned person. So, but for 30 seconds though, you put it on high intensity. So you're basically standing up on the pedals, you know, pulling out, pulling up on the pedal. Like you see Lance Armstrong, you know, going through the Pyrenees during, um, um, you know, the, 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 the big, um, the yellow jacket race there. And then after 30 seconds, you feel like your lungs are exploding, you sit down. And now it's 30 seconds of recovery. 30 seconds still pedaling, 30 seconds, you think, oh my God, I didn't know 30 seconds would go by that quickly. You jack it up to intense again. And then you go 30 seconds again, standing up on your pedals, putting on the pedals, pulling on the handlebars. You're going and you're thinking my heart's gonna explode. And then you quieten down again. And that's, it's the going back and forth that leads to a better, stronger, and the heart's a muscle it adapts better. And now a lot of cardio rehab are doing interval training and maybe not full out high intensity. Basically it could be as little as low intensity, moderate intensity. So you're basically walking between light posts and then doing a power walk between the next light post and then walking the next light post. So it can be um, moderated or attenuated for different people's health care you know, status. But five minutes of that it's the equivalent of an hour, Howard. So there's literally no excuse. Like five minutes is crazy. Sometimes Carrie will be making breakfast. I'll come down in my house coat while she's, you know, cooking up the steel cut oats. I'll walk downstairs to the, the basement, do six minutes of interval training, come up with a light, you know, bead of sweat on my forehead. And she goes, damn it, you worked out, didn't you? And I, I said, I'm guilty. I did my five minutes. And the kids go, dad, you know, play with us. So instead of spending an hour running on my flat feet like Freddie Flintstone, I'm five minutes, come up, happy, hang out with the kids, and I'm on to my day. Okay, I, I want to ask you another thing. I want to ask you a question about yoga because a lot of dentists and hygienists, myself included, um, actually have an occupational injury because I lean my 10-pound bowling ball head over <laughs> like this. Because, I love that bowling ball. <laughs> well, I mean, I know that I was supposed to uh, look through a mirror and indirect vision, all that stuff. But I, I looked direct and I, I leaned my head over and I looked direct. And I'm telling you young kids out there, I'm 52. I jack my neck 
And it was a dentist's wife. He told me like two years ago. She goes, I, she goes your neck's really bothered. And I said, it, it, it bothers me all the time. She said, do hot bicker yoga. So I started doing hot bicker yoga two years ago. And I swear, I'm like a heroin addict when it comes to hot bicker yoga. I mean, I love it. Uh, I mean, you, you could take away my bike, my swim, my orange theory, my cross fitness. The, you could take away everything, but you could never take away my yoga. And and um, all that um, all that neck and pain and stuff. What what do you think of yoga? And do you think hot yoga is any different than cold room yoga? Or do, and, and back to stretching. There's a big debate on Dental Town whether or not you should even stretch because some people say. Well, a lion and a tiger and a cheetah, they don't stretch out before all of a sudden they go from complete stationary to chasing down a gazelle. So answer my question on what are your thoughts on yoga? No, flexibility, when you think of the three components of a good quality, complete exercise program, um, strength training is one, aerobic conditioning is the other one, and third is flexibility. So flexibility is very important. So, And there's debates as to when you do it and how often and how long. Uh, the debate is do you do it before the run or after the run? The new thought is, you, you, you stretch to increase flexibility after your body's warmed up. When you stretch on the step before you go for a jog, that's basically just getting your mind in gear for the jog. You're not basically going to prevent an injury. They've shown now that stretching before a run does not prevent injury. All it does is, from my aspect and what, what I see with all the studies, it just sets your mind and it gets you into the mindset on preparing for activity. The lion just leaps off the ground, right? So I, I totally understand where that's coming from. So the new way to, to do flexibility is, after you've already warmed up. So after the weight training, after the run, that's when, you, that's when you stretch for flexibility training. And it should be two to three times a week for 10 minutes, ideally. And to give you an idea how easy that is to do, the sad part is only 4% of North Americans have a complete exercise program, whether you do weight training, cardiovascular, and stretching. Only 4% of 330 million. So it's really not that many. But all things left aside, um, I do yoga now. I used to do it three times a week. My dad passed away in 2010, um, in November, suddenly. And um, I thought, I can't go back to the same life. You know, here's the guy who, I'm, the reason why I'm here, um, to honor him, I'm, I'm, I was thinking, for the next year, I'm going to do something completely new. I, I'm a big person of, you know, like Carl Jung, there's an AM to PM to life. You do things in the PM differently than the AM. So when my dad died in 2010, I was um, 47. I said to myself, I want the PM now, the next 47 years has to be a little different. So I said, what can I do a little differently? I thought, I parked behind this car at, at a mall. And it said Soul Seeker behind it on the license plate. And I looked up and it was in front of a yoga studio. And I thought, okay, I'm a pretty intuitive guy. I, I listened to my gut. I've got good gut flora, right? And I thought to myself, okay, I went in there, signed up for a month for 40 bucks, all you can do. I went 15 times. <laughs> I went for a year, three times a week, hot yoga, and um, never felt better. Um, it was crazy how it made my neck feel better, my back feel better. I felt more limber. You know, my kids, eight, six, and three, they can do straddle holes. They can do pikes. They can do the splits. Hear me, I'm stretching down. I can't do the splits. So I realize as we get older, we get stiffer. And I think, you know, rigid body, rigid mind, rigor mortis. Flexible body, flexible mind, flexible life. So I think for a dentist who wants to earn more, a hygienist who wants to earn more, I think flexibility is a key part of having good languaging and good body control and less injuries. But I, I'm just looking at a study here. And I, I, I'm certified to the National Strength and Conditioning Association. And this is one of our journals. I get these crazy, you know, 200 page journals every month. And um, uh, here's one, it's, um, it was the first of its kind. It looked at Bikram yoga, which is a hot yoga. And after uh, 10 weeks of Bikram yoga, adults, they had a large increase in shoulder and lower back and hamstring flexibility. And hamstring tightness is a big part of lower back pain. And rotator shoulder muscles, where because we always lean over, no matter how good our loops are, dentists, we have tight chest, we lean over, very poor rotator cuff issues, those little four little muscles always being irritated, lots of shoulder replacements, spurs and tendonitis. It's, you know, you can be a high end athlete, but it's the shoulder that's going to bring down the lion, you know, having that shoulder that's not stretching well. So this is the first of its kind in 2013. And it showed how there was a large increase in um, shoulder, lower back and hamstring flexibility. And they looked at Bikram yoga in particular. So um, what I'm in town, I, I do now only an hour a week, which is not enough. You know, an hour a week is better than nothing. But I do an hour a week every Friday night if I'm in town at 7.30. It's a hot yoga class. It's a $7 drop-in. I'm the only guy there. And guess what happens when you're the only guy in a yoga class? Guess what the ladies do? What? What, what do you do for a living? I'm a dentist. What do you think they ask next? Where's your card? You know, we want to come to you because you look like such a nice, balanced guy. 
So, and I'm not even looking for new patients. Like if I was a 20 year old or 25 year old starving new dentist with cobwebs on my back, I'd get, I'd go to yoga class in three different yoga locations. I'd wear, I put my office name on my back. I put my office name on my butt. Okay. And everyone in that class would be saying, oh my gosh, you're a dentist. Where's your office? They first want to know this is so cool that a male dentist is here. Where is your office? So that would be my, my huge productivity advice to any of our listeners today. You do your hot yoga as a guy, you're going to get two handout cards every time you go to a class. And, 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 and for a guy, yoga is very different because you also get your cardio workout because those women are so hot. Your, your heart is just <laughs> poor joke. And I, well, no, no, well, I, I, I said yoga is a cardio workout because they're so hot in there. Your heart is racing. <laughs> but but, oh, I, sure. but I, I just want to say that uh, when I get up at uh, five and do the five thirty. Uh, to um, it's 90 minutes. It's uh, five, five thirty to uh, seven, man. When you walk into work after that, you just feel jacked. And then when somebody, th- then, then some, then the things that used to bother you in the past, the insurance wouldn't pay her. They need a letter. Or this patient's mad or something went wrong in the old day. When you woke up and ate frosted flakes, you, you might have angina and be mad and upset. But man, after you do 90 minutes yoga, I don't care what the world throws at you. You're just you just smiling, bad off. Hey, I'm out of time. I can't I believe I'm at an hour and one. But uh, seriously, I really wish you would create an online CE course for Dental Town. Maybe it's part of a series. I, I think it. I think it'd be great business for you because it's gonna. It'd be the best marketing you could uh, from around the world. Those those things are watched from here in Australia, New Zealand, all that stuff. Uh, I'll do but, it. But seriously, I just want to. I just want to end on one thing. Is that is uh, you know. Again, I got my MAGD. I got my diplomat and implants. I got my fellowship. I, I do all that stuff. But you know what? None of those things matter if your instrument's not in order. And if, you're, if your body and mind and soul isn't in the right place, you're not going to solve any of your problems by buying a CIRAC machine. And man, what you do for people. I mean, everybody I know that's ever met you, listened to you, saw you. I mean, they're just... you. All your fans are raving. So if you are looking for a speaker at your next study club or your next meeting or whatever, fire them all up. You would be the ultimate opener, closer, I mean, all day or whatever. But uh, I just love everything you're doing. And uh, kudos to you. And I hope to see you again. Yeah, thanks, Howard. I appreciate the work you're doing, too. And I'd I love to be back. And I take your challenge of doing that one-hour uh, CD course. I will do it. Trust me. I will do it. All right. Thank you, buddy. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Yes, and happy you too. St. Patty's Day, my Irish brother. Yes, <laughs> my kindred spirit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye bye. Goodbye.